Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to Volition Rx Limited's fourth quarter and full year 2020 earnings conference call. During today's presentation, all parties will be in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, the conference call will be open for questions. If you have a question, please press the star key followed by the number one on your touchstone telephone. If you'd like to withdraw your question, please press the star key followed by the number two. If you're using speaker equipment, please lift the handset before making your selections. This conference is being recorded today, March 8, March 18, 23rd, 2021. I'd now like to turn the conference call over to Mr. Scott Powell. Please go ahead, Scott. Thank you, and welcome everyone to today's earnings conference call for Volition RX Limited. This call will cover Volition's financial and operating results for the fourth quarter and full year of 2020, along with a discussion of our recent activities and key upcoming milestones. Following our prepared remarks, we will open the conference call to a question and answer session. Also on our call today are Mr. Cameron Reynolds, President and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Terry Hughes, our recently appointed Chief Financial Officer, and Dr. Jake McAuliffe, our Chief Scientific Officer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that some of the information discussed on this conference call will include forward-looking statements covered under the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements are based on our beliefs as well as assumptions we have used based upon information currently available to us. Because these statements reflect our current views concerning future events, these statements involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions. Actual future results may vary significantly based on a number of factors that may cause the actual results or events to be materially different from future results, performance, or achievements expressed or implied by these statements. We have identified various risk factors associated with our operations in our most recent annual report on Form 10-K, quarterly reports on Form 10-Q, and other filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We do not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements made during the course of this call. I'd now like to turn the call over to our President and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Cameron Reynolds. Cameron? Thank you, everyone, for joining Volition's conference call today. I especially appreciate it, given the busy earnings call season. I'd like to start yet again by recognizing the amazing commitment and hard work shown by all of our team over the past year during these difficult times. I could not be prouder of their efforts. Despite the lockdowns, we have managed to keep our main lab in Namur operational and open the new Silver One production facility, and indeed have made such varied and significant progress in so many areas of the business throughout 2020 and into the first quarter of 2021. Now that we have such a stable, reliable, reproducible platform technology that we think can and will be highly disruptive and influential worldwide in a wide range of areas. Before passing over to Tereg, who will cover the financials, and then moving on to our product launches, this being our annual call, I will start today by briefly discussing our 2020 highlights as a reminder of all the progress we have made in the last year. We bookended this year strongly, firstly by closing our acquisition of Optima in January, and then by launching our first product, the new QVET cancer screening test in December, and achieved lots of exciting milestones in between. As a reminder, the strategic acquisition of Optima helps secure the supply of one of the key components of our new Q tests, the recumbent nucleosomes, which we use as the calibrant. The transfer of know-how is now complete, and we now have the capability to manufacture a wide range of these key components in-house. 2020 was a pivotal year for new QVET. It is truly remarkable to reflect that we only reported the proof of concept data in April of last year. And yet by the Veterinary Cancer Society Conference in October of 2020, we published full study results, hosted a key opinion leader roundtable event, and by year end, launched the new QVET cancer screening test with Texas A&M. This is all a truly fantastic team effort and refocusing on near-term product launch opportunities during the pandemic showed the amazing flexibility of our platform and team. 
This flexibility is a key aspect of our success. Throughout the year, we, as always, continue to strengthen our large intellectual property portfolio with additional patents being granted and new patent applications submitted, including in relation to the use of new Q technology in mitosis, COVID-19, and other diseases. And we now hold 64 patents worldwide with a further 90 patents pending. We also published and or presented at a number of conferences, most notably at ASCO 2020, with varied abstracts featuring performance data on our new Q technology with respect to lung cancer and blood cancer, as well as performance data on new Q capture. At our virtual markets day in October, we announced our commitment to two blood cancer studies, both to be conducted in the US. The first of these studies is a large scale, up to 1,500 subjects, regulatory study into the five most common types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the second is a proof of concept study for the monitoring of treatment response for the most aggressive NHL cancer, DLBCL. Both studies are now underway with results from the treatment response study expected later in the first half of this year, and likely the first readout from the NHL regulatory 4510K study within the next year. So we have had an action-packed 2020 and have a lot to review from the start of 2021. But before I go into more details, please allow me to introduce our new Chief Financial Officer, Terry Hughes, who will take you through the key financial results for 2020 and provide an update on the recent financing transactions that have significantly strengthened our cash position. Terry, great to have you on board. Over to you. Thanks very much, Cameron, and thank you everyone for joining our earnings call today. I look forward to meeting many of you in person when possible. I'll now provide a summary of the key financial results. For the year ended December 31, 2020, we reported a net loss of $20.4 million as compared to a net loss of $16.1 million in the prior year. This result was predominantly driven by higher research and development spending, which increased by $4.2 million over the prior year period, to $14.5 million in 2020 reflecting the investments we made in expanding our employee team and securing the supply and manufacture of key components through the Optima acquisition, as well as higher research spending directed at COVID-19 and netosis. Despite this higher level of spending, we closed out 2020 with cash and cash equivalents of $19.4 million, compared with approximately $17 million at the end of 2019. And to add to this, during the first quarter of 2021 to date, we have significantly strengthened our balance sheet by adding an aggregate of approximately $20.5 million in cash through an underwritten public offering of our common stock in February, as well as through our at-the-market equity distribution program. Furthermore, in January, we were delighted to announce the award of approximately $4 million in non-diluted funding from the Walloon region and the Moore Invest. We have a long history of support from the agencies of the Walloon region who to date have awarded volition approximately 13 million in non-diluted funding, including this most recent award. We would like to publicly thank Monsieur Willy Borsas, Vice President of the Walloon Government, the Walloon Minister for Economy, as well as Nicolas Delahaye and Renaud Hatiez from Namur Invest for the financial assistance and their continued support. So just to recap, before taking into account the expenses we have incurred thus far in 2021, our cash and cash equivalents total approximately $40 million, which is by far the strongest cashed position we have ever had in the company's history. Nevertheless, we continue to manage our expenditures carefully. Our burn rate through the final quarter of 2020 was on average approximately 1.5 million per month. Overall, we would expect this to increase slightly as we make additional investment towards our product launches and expansion of our platform, and I will provide periodic updates on our future earning calls. In summary, we're in a strong financial position, providing us both a great runway to achieve our many milestones and continuing flexibility to weather the pandemic. And with that, I will pass back to Cameron for further operational and product updates. Thanks, Terry. And I'm absolutely delighted to have the strongest balance sheet we've ever had, and great to have you on board. In fact, whilst talking of new team members, I'd also like to publicly welcome Gail Forter, our new Chief Commercial Officer. 
to our executive management team, as well as congratulate Katan Michelle for his promotion to Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. Mark Eccleston, one of our founding scientists, for his promotion to the newly created role of Chief Technology Officer. As we are transitioning from a research and development company to a commercial company, we're excited to strengthen the leadership team with these key appointments. All four bring strong global expertise and experience to their respective roles, and these appointments aim to provide a very strong product focus to our management team. Also, from an expansion point of view, we're absolutely thrilled to have opened Silver One, the production hub for our products and components close to our lab in Belgium. I am very happy to announce today that we are now producing several of our key components and plan to achieve a full ISO certification later this year. As with our previous real estate transactions, the vast majority of the purchase and fit-out costs were supported through non-dilutive grants and loans from the Namur region, again helping to keep our burn rate relatively low. We are well into the process of producing at large scale raw materials such as recombinant nucleosomes, which act as a calibrant in our nuclear assays, in addition to antibodies that are key elements to our branded products, and indeed will manufacture our full diagnostic kits once finalized. We expect to offer all elements for both commercial sale and for clinical trial purposes and CE Mark products for sale in Europe and beyond. We're also installing a service lab in the new Silver One facility, which will undertake sample processing for external parties, including sample processing for new vet in Europe, more of which I'll discuss later. The opening of our new Silver One facility not only brings the manufacture of key components in-house, thereby securing our supply chain, but it also should significantly reduce the cost of production of any of these elements and should in turn reduce the cost of future assay development. It really is an exciting time, and I could not be happier that we could find a suitable site so closely situated to our current lab. Plus, it's another great step forward on a road to a diverse revenue stream. Speaking of revenue, I was delighted to have appointed our first sales manager in Europe, Emmanuel de Milcomp, who started with us in December. Emmanuel brings over 25 years of sales experience in the diagnostic field, having worked for companies such as Roche, Sanofi, and most recently, Vela. He has already proven to be an excellent addition to our team with his focus to help drive revenue from our Silver One facility. Emmanuel has been hard at work at generating initial revenues for our products in Europe, and we will update you with the results of his excellent work in our next quarterly earnings call in May. And finally, with regards to organizational expansion, we opened a small shared laboratory in California State University, San Marcos, in the fourth quarter. This lab is led by Dr. Terry Kelly, Chief Scientific Officer of Volition America, Inc., and focuses on blue sky innovation and discovery research, which we hope will help us leapfrog forward on some of our cutting edge research projects. And so, to our first products and revenue. Many of you have followed and supported Volition for many, many years and know that it has been a long and winding road. And so the whole team was especially delighted to launch our first commercial product, the new QVET cancer screening test shortly after our 10 year company anniversary in the fourth quarter of last year. This was an extremely important milestone for the company as this first launch that we expect to be the first of many demonstrates that our platform has reached a level of reliability and reproducibility to be launched in a completely independent laboratory. The test is positioned for use in both the annual health check for older dogs, those that are seven years and older, and for cases where there is a high suspicion of cancer. It may also be a complementary test for younger dogs of breeds at high risk for developing cancer in their lifetimes, such as golden retrievers. The test is currently available only from the GR lab at Texas A&M University, with the beta launch focusing on veterinarians across Texas. So, what is a beta launch exactly? The beta launch is to facilitate real-world learning from actual customers paying for the test. To help shape the marketing mix before we launch nationally across the US, as expected in the next few months. It also gives us a chance to showcase the product to the large multinational vet companies we are in very active discussions with, which, if concluded successfully, would help greatly accelerate launches and sales worldwide. Given this is our very first commercial launch, we are using Texas as the test market to make sure all aspects of our products are properly tested before we launch in the US nationally and worldwide and to help us address beforehand any issues with companies who may end up distributing or licensing our VET products. 
we are gaining extremely valuable feedback on key factors such as the logistics of a veterinarian taking a sample, shipping, processing, reporting, and interpretation of the results, levels of customer service required, pet owner feedback, and of course, the optimal pricing at all levels. The team has also done a fantastic job in starting to educate the KOLs, the key opinion leaders, the oncology specialists and GP veterinarians in Texas about nucleosomics and raising the general awareness of the new Q vet cancer screening test. In terms of the commercial opportunity and the addressable market, cancer in dogs is widespread. It is a leading cause of death in dogs over the age of 10, and there are over 6 million new dog cancer diagnoses in the US alone each year. As cancer screening is not as commonplace in the animal health as it is in human health, we believe blood tests like the new Q vet cancer screening test could help transform how veterinarians manage cancer in companion animals. Early diagnosis of cancer has the potential to help improve the treatment and quality of life, as well as providing valuable additional information to inform the clinical decision-making process. Our new QVET cancer screening test is a simple, low-cost, easy-to-use ELISA-based blood test, which we believe will help streamline the screening process for up to one-third of malignancies in dogs, including common malignancies such as lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma. We recognize the desire to receive revenue guidance now that we have had our first commercial product and aim to provide this later in the year when the mix of our own launches and licensing of our technologies to third parties in both the veterinary and human spaces become clearer. Suffice it to say, we are very happy with how the beta launch is going. It is providing us with absolutely invaluable information and our very first ever product revenue. We received the first order for our kits from the GR Lab late last year, and since then, they have reordered kits twice already this year. In addition to the Texas beta launch, to leverage our global team, I'm delighted to say that we are finalizing beta launch planning in both Asia and Europe for our vet cancer screening test and expect a lot of news on these in the next few months. We're also continuing significant licensing discussions with the well-known major players in the vet space around the world. I look forward to updating you on our progress in the coming months. We're at the very beginning, but we believe that is a fantastic opportunity and we are truly excited to start commercial operations. Moving on from the vet business to human cancers, where, in parallel, we're also continuing to make progress. In January, at the world's largest dedicated lung cancer conference, the WCLC, an abstract was presented by one of the members of the National Taiwan University team. The key message from this presentation is that, based on an interim analysis of a subset of subjects in our ongoing study, new assays could help identify non-cancerous nodules following the scan thereby reducing unnecessary biopsies by as much as 32%. These results of this subset of the 1,200 subject study are very promising. As you will know, low-dose computed tomography, LDCT, is the widely accepted standard for screening of individuals at high risk of lung cancer. However, LDCT has several limitations, including poor specificity, which means high false positives, Results from the study suggest that nucleosomes and histone PGMs may discriminate well between non-cancerous benign nodules versus very early stage lung cancers, stage 0, stage 1, stage 2, in non-familial lung cancer history patients. The ability to distinguish between cancerous and non-cancerous nodules could reduce both unnecessary biopsies and the frequency of radiation exposure from repeated LDCT scanning. Professor Chen the study's principal investigator said at the time of the conference, to accomplish this result through a non-invasive blood test would be an important step forward in lung cancer screening. Lung cancer remains the deadliest of all the cancers and there is a high unmet clinical need for improved diagnosis. We are hopeful that our new Q assays can help and are delighted that our world-renowned collaborators presented this data at such a prestigious conference. We share our collaborators' excitement to complete this study and report the findings at scientific conferences later this year. And if it continues to go well, launch a 510K regulatory study in the US, like we have in the blood cancers. We've also made great progress on the research program for the use of our new Q technology in netosis, and in particular in monitoring disease progression of COVID-19 and sepsis, and, as announced earlier this week, as a potential companion diagnostic for a treatment of sepsis 
and are looking to broaden this further into influenza and potentially other diseases associated with mitosis. To add a bit more colour to this discussion, as this is a new and very exciting use of our new Q platform, and to provide some of the science behind it, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jake McAuliffe, our Chief Scientific Officer. Thanks, Cameron, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. While cancer remains our core disease focus, given the relatively recent understanding of the prominent role of both NETs and nucleosomes in the pathology of COVID-19, sepsis, and many other diseases, we are also researching the use of our proprietary technology in diseases with particular regard to NETs and mitosis. In terms of background science, white blood cells help protect the body against infection by engulfing invading viruses and bacteria and producing antibodies against them. In addition, white cells also eject chromatin material out of the cell to form neutrophil extracellular traps, or NETs, which catch and trap invading viruses. In a respiratory infection like COVID-19, white cells migrate to the lungs where they produce nets to trap and kill the virus. This protects the lungs and prevents the virus from spreading to the rest of the body. Nets are therefore a crucial part of the immune system. However, overproduction of nets is pathological and elevated levels of nets are a clinical complication of COVID-19 leading to poor patient outcomes and can actually be fatal. Nets are similarly a complicating factor in a wide variety of other diseases, including respiratory infections, SARS and pneumonia, as well as metabolic diseases, autoimmune conditions, inflammatory conditions, cancer, thrombosis, stroke, and sepsis. The ejected nets material is made up of nucleosomes. And Volition has spent 10 years developing antibodies and assays for nucleosomes. So we are well placed to take a leading role in much of this research. We can detect nets in minute quantities using Volition's new Q nucleosome assays. Indeed, I believe our assays are the only analytically validated quantitative nucleosome assays currently available. We're investigating the use of the new Q platform to monitor natosis disease progression and treatment response across a wide range of diseases that involve the overproduction of nets. Last year, we showed that nucleosome levels strongly correlated with disease severity in the first wave of COVID-19 patients. Patients admitted to hospitals had higher levels than patients with mild disease. Patients requiring intensive medical support in intensive care units had higher levels of nucleosomes than patients admitted to regular hospital wards. And patients who died had even higher levels of nucleosomes than patients in intensive care who survived. We have now conducted studies of serial testing in individual COVID-19 patients admitted during the second wave to determine how predictive our test is. This has taken longer than we expected as the hospitals we are working with have, understandably, been focused on caring for the very high numbers of patients admitted during the second wave of the virus. We will announce data from human COVID-19 and sepsis studies over the coming quarters. In addition, we are releasing data from an animal study of sepsis this week in a presentation by Dr. Andrew Aswani, a consultant in critical care and anesthesia at one of London's leading teaching hospitals. This small initial study looks at the use of Volition's new Q NETS assay to monitor treatment response to a novel therapy to remove NETS from the circulation in a pig model of sepsis resulting in improved physiological and biochemical well-being indicators of the pigs. The results showed that the treatment was successful and that our new Q assay was the best and most practical way to measure the NETS response. The studies are now progressing to investigate further animal models and the first human trial is already being recruited. Following this success, we are investigating two further therapeutic antibody netosis drugs, both in relation to treatment monitoring and for use as a companion diagnostic for patient selection. While netosis is still a relatively new field for volition, given positive early results, this is shaping up to be potentially a significant new opportunity to utilize our new Q platform. We have formed a new Q Next team to provide increased focus and drive to the product development program. This once again underlines the strong breadth of the new Q platform technology 
which is supported by our broad intellectual property portfolio. Exciting times for sure, with further data due to be presented at upcoming conferences. And with that, I'll hand back to Cameron. Thanks a lot, Jake. Exciting times indeed. And so to the future. I would like to reiterate our vision and what makes us so excited with the progress and our space. Volition is an epigenetics company focusing on advancing the science of epigenetics and exploiting these advances in human and animal health. This has been our mission since our founding, and it is coming to fruition with our new food platform at the very heart of epigenetics. We believe the last decade of work at Volition, with our ever-expanding team in epigenetics, puts us in an extremely strong position with our expansive IP portfolio to be a significant player in this key field. Overall, on so many fronts, with our ever-growing team and IP, I'm delighted with the progress we are making, and I'm excited by the momentum we have developed in the epigenetics field. Indeed, our whole team is incredibly excited by the company's future opportunities. We aim to report throughout 2021 and beyond numerous key milestones. Now that we're in full swing, in turning our platform into a range of products worldwide. We will focus on driving revenue in the coming quarters, where possible during the pandemic, in four key areas. One, vet products. Two, disease monitoring tests, such as in COVID and sepsis. Three, using our new production facility to drive reagent sales. And four, licensing of our technology for others to commercialize worldwide in both the human and vet space. We also aim to publish data on multiple fronts, including new Q capture, which I have not discussed at length today, but is also making very strong progress. I, along with the rest of the board, and indeed the whole company, look forward to sharing the results of key studies over the coming months and year with our optimized platform. Despite the pandemic, 2020 proved to be our most exciting year yet, thanks to our fantastic hardworking team, but we're hopeful 2021 can top it. Thanks again for joining the call today. I very much appreciate it, given the busy earnings call season. We're happy to take questions. Operator? Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad, and a confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. And our first question is from the line of Kyle Mixon with Cantor Fitzgerald. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the questions, and congrats on all the progress this year. It's great to see. Just regarding the uh, necrosis trial that you're still negotiating, I just had a few questions around that. So first, is the intention to conduct a trial that kind of looks at all or maybe or some of those diseases like COVID, influenza, sepsis, or will just one be examined in the trial? And then second, is it possible that the trial could assess uh, treatment monitoring with mitosis-based therapeutic antibody uh, drugs? I know Jake mentioned this, and there's a few that you guys are, are looking at. I was wondering if that's a potential application in the in the trial. And then finally, when you say like a large trial, I noticed that in the in the press release. Does that maybe mean like the size of the blood cancer study um, in the U.S.? Thanks. Hi, uh, and thanks, <laughs> thanks for your support, and uh, there's some very good questions. I'll, I'll answer those briefly myself and then see if Jake has anything to add. Um, so, yeah, of course, so the, steps, the first question really, I, I guess, pertains to whether we do a separate uh, natosis trial for COVID, for influenza, and sepsis. Um, we have been in discussions on one for uh, influenza and uh, COVID, but I, I think uh, given where we are, we're probably more focused now on having one for sepsis because it's a, a very, very, uh, I think, as you know, it's what kills most people in hospitals. Um, obviously, it would be applicable if it works in sepsis. It will almost uh, certainly work in the others. Um, but uh, influenza and, and COVID, you know, the numbers obviously go up and down, and, and they've sort of overwhelmed hospitals at the moment. So uh, we are uh, in the US. We're looking to do a, a large trial, um, which is the third question. Um, it's probably, it would be about the same cost, we'd expect, as, as the other 510Ks. But when you're doing longitudinal samples, um, which this would probably be, you have a, a probably the similar number of samples, but less patients, if that makes sense, um, because you're looking to get four or five samples from each patient. So um, it would be a very similar scale of trial. The, the exact numbers you need for a longitudinal study 
uh, we're still working on. But uh, I think we'll end up um, with a product for mitosis, uh, which will work in sepsis. Uh, we expect and hope. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But that's uh, you know all the things we've seen now are extremely encouraging. Um, so and, and that would be useful for all three. So we're just debating at the moment um, whether the first cab off the rank, if you will, we'd go for a one on on um, for influenza and COVID, or whether we would look to do one in sepsis. But um, sepsis is probably uh, the big market that's probably obviously going to continue for a long, long time, given it's it's such an endemic issue. Um, and as far as the drugs, uh, we can. Uh, we, so we're looking at several therapies. I, I believe Jake can confirm this, but the the trial for the drugs would be a separate one because obviously that's um, it's not diagnostic or prognostic or disease progression. Uh, this would actually be as a companion diagnostic. So as you uh, as you saw, we had fantastic data with Santursus. Our assays worked uh, spectacularly well and by far the best. And of course, our assays are always routine, low cost, easy to use. So I think we'd have tremendous advantages over any options. Um, but the, the trials uh, would be di different from the uh, other ones for sepsis and COVID because that would be the diagnostic ones. But uh, I think we would look to certainly the proof of concept studies on the, uh, you are correct, uh, there's the Santersis method of therapies. And we're also looking at some potential drugs and proteins. Um, that can also be useful. So we could probably package those together in a proof of concept study where we're testing several of those at the same time. Um, but I'd imagine the actual therapy trial would have to be uh, something separate because it's a companion diagnostic to the therapy. But um, I, I think uh, I think and Jake can uh, confirm all of this. But it's it's incredibly exciting to be at the heart of all of this as well as cancer in the vet space. Jake, did I did I get that right? Anything you'd like to add? No, I think uh, I think you've uh, got it. Got pretty much all of it there. The, um, the the sort of background is that the the way that the nets behave is is similar in all of these diseases. So uh, so you could, in principle, have have a, a diagnostic for nets. In the beginning, we are looking at at separate diseases. All of that is going very well. Um, and probably, as Cameron said at the beginning, it will be um, sepsis or COVID. Uh, and later on, we we might be able to look actually at, at mitosis as a as an, uh, an indication in itself. And and I think it's important to just reiterate: um, it, it has taken some time. We were hoping for some data late last year, but as we've said a few times, it's very understandable that. Uh, some of the trials, longitudinal studies uh, have been tough during uh, when, uh, when an emergency ward is overwhelmed, taking 10 samples from one patient uh, is not their top priority, quite, quite naturally and, and quite rightly. But um, I, I couldn't express strongly, uh, too strongly how happy we are with the results and how our collaborators are really appreciating not just how well the data is coming out, but also how well our assays perform. All the work we've done and now means we can ship kits to a range of places where they can be run and they're just working tremendously well, both in doing what they should be doing um, and also just being robust and reproducible and reliable. So I think we've put ourselves in a really good position and um, we'll have a lot more updates on this throughout the next month or two and uh, through the quarters, but um, I think this is going to be a big part and one of our four key pillars of the company going forward because, um, uh, yeah, NETS is uh, only recently understood, but I think we can be really at the heart of uh, the treatment as well as the diagnostic, prognostic, and, and disease progression uh, for netosis as well. Okay, that was great. Thanks so much, Cameron and Jake. That was an excellent, um, really comprehensive answer there. And I just wanted to switch to the, the, um, you know, the vet cancer screening product. On the beta launch in Asia and Europe, really encouraging. Uh, to hear you guys kind of want to um, target those markets, obviously pretty large. I know it's still pretty early on, obviously. What's the general plan with like um, with marketing distribution? And do you already have relationships with some vets, I guess, in Asia and Europe, maybe similar to what you have in the U.S. with Texas A&M? And then, you know, I, again, another difficult question to kind of answer at this time, but when could the launch maybe occur? Is that more a 2022 event, or could that possibly happen in the back end of uh, of this year? Thank you. Uh, very good question. So, yeah, we've actually obviously got a strong footprint in Europe and in Asia. Um, we're very hopeful it'll be this year, and actually uh, it, it could be reasonably soon because we're uh, we're doing a lot of work on this. Uh, we like to do beta, the same lessons we're learning in the U.S. Uh, we can use a lot of them, obviously, in different markets, but every market is a bit different. Um, we're in quite advanced discussions in Asia, and, and we're starting in Singapore because that's where we are. 
um, and you can learn a lot of lessons in a, a place like this, uh, like Singapore, and then use that for, for other markets. Um, so I'd expect that uh, in, in the short to medium term. Um, in Europe, uh, we're actually very active, active as well and looking perhaps for a slightly different model. Um, you know, we've been shipping kits to Texas uh, GI lab, but we actually have our own lab in, in Belgium now, a silver one, <laughs> the famous silver one. Um, so one option we're exploring very seriously is actually that becoming the uh, equivalent of the lab like the GI lab in uh, in Texas. So then we could be running the samples as well. And that's for that way we can also, because it's right in the heart of Europe, uh, it's an easy place to ship to. Obviously Belgium is right, uh, in a, very well located and we are the best at running the tests ourselves. So I, I think that the three main ways of generating revenue from the vet space we're actively looking at uh, for this year. That's the, the kit sales, like we are with um, Texas currently. Um, then uh, running it as a service, I, I think there's a very strong chance we'll have that running in kind of the medium term um, uh, of this year um, in, uh, in Belgium. And we're looking, uh, and in, in Singapore as well, having a, a lab where we, we run the, the tests either contracted out or one we set up ourselves. And also I, I think we really should emphasize um, what, what, what the beta launch has also given us, apart from all the learnings, is very much the attention of the big companies as well. Um, you're taken much more seriously when you run the product yourself, you show it works. Um, you know, we're, we're not testing the product. The product has worked absolutely uh, perfectly. We're testing the marketing, the logistics, and all those lessons are very helpful for the bigger companies as well. Um, I won't mention the names on the call, because, but there, there are only two big companies, and we're in very active discussions with both for different reasons. And uh, that could really turbocharge the revenue if, if we ended up doing something we could accept with them. Um, they each have hundreds and hundreds of salespeople uh, throughout the U.S. and worldwide. So I, I think it's very fair to say I, I'd be uh, I'd be upset if we didn't uh, say, is it possible for this year? I'd be very upset if they both weren't uh, launched uh, this year and perhaps sort of uh, more sooner rather than later for at least one of them. And uh, there will be a mix of all three. What, what, what our platform really allows us to do is all three. We can sell kits. We can do it as a service and we can license just direct out, but still selling our key components. And I'd expect all three to have a strong component worldwide. So, uh, yeah, this has been happening below the surface. Um, obviously, we can't say anything in, until beyond that until it actually happens, but I'd expect to see a lot of progress on all these fronts this year. And the, uh, the beta testing has been, uh, the beta launch and all the testing we've been doing has been completely invaluable. Um, so we still uh, think of what we've said before, it's a market that could absolutely uh, change the way Volition is, is seen and, and generate a lot of revenue. So we're taking it very seriously, and you'll see a lot more news on that in the coming months and quarters. Did that answer your question? Perfect. Oh. Yeah, that, that was great. Thanks a lot for that, Cameron. Uh, just, just one last question for me. Similar line of thought, um, maybe on the expansion in the U.S. with the VET uh, test. So um, I, I guess how are you evaluating some of the markets that you want to expand into? Like what you're evaluating marketing mix, I guess, right? So you know, what have, what have you seen so far with respect to um, how different marketing channels are, um, you know, how they're responding or what the feedback has been to um, your efforts thus far? And, um, and yeah, just how are you thinking about the, the, the expansion in, in the U.S. really? And, and what, I don't know, what can we expect maybe over the next few months or so? Just, uh, I know, just broad, you know, uh, high-level kind of comments would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking now, obviously, the... Uh, all those key lessons uh, pertain to we wanted to get right before we launched nationally. Uh, they sound boring and, and things, but the logistics are very important. Whether at dog, we've had feedback that less fasting is better, so we're doing tests now to see if we can bring that down from eight hours to four hours, uh, then it doesn't have to be overnight. Um, whether you can ship, uh, we're testing also just overnight on ice rather than freezing, all these kind of things uh, are, are big for us. Uh, what our, our marketing mix looks like actually would, I think, depend on whether we do end up doing a deal with uh, either or both of the major players, um, because if, if part of doing a deal with one of the major players, particularly in the U.S., is they would really lean into the public awareness and the marketing. So, uh, obviously, um, anything like that um, would be a much bigger market. We'd get a slightly smaller share of it, of course, or but um, you would you would you would do that because it would greatly. Uh, that it, the only reason we, the only way we do it is if they're really leaning into the sales and marketing as well. So we're working through um, all of that ourselves, and um, obviously, if we do not do a deal with a major player in the US, then we'll uh, do a lot more marketing and, and uh, facilities and, and the process. If we do, we'll end up doing less. 
um, and that will become obvious uh, in that mix as we um, finish off the, the beta launch and then work out what licensing and or, or marketing we're going to be doing with the larger companies. So I'd expect to have that sorted out in the next quarter or two, um, and then that mix was, was how we'll go forward. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. But again, guys, congrats on all this progress. Looking forward to the updates coming up. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jason McCarthy with Maxim Group. Please just with your question. Uh, sorry about that. I was on mute. Uh, mute. This is Michael <laughs> Kinoich on the line. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Anytime. I'd like to gauge just on the um, – on the size of those Texas A&M orders, because you mentioned that there were three additional in 2021, uh, were, were those based on the um, the demand they're seeing, or were they more expected as A&M scales up uh, their supply for the launch? Oh, it's completely based on demand. So they, uh, you see from the accounts, it was just a little over seven thousand dollars, which equates to four kits which if, if they used every plate, uh, which they, they don't because they have to do some repeats and things, but that's about 160, uh, what, we're making the revenue from 160, if that makes sense. And uh, actually, you probably noticed in the, the script it was two, and then I, I said three because they just reordered uh, a few days ago, and there was some time between the recording. So uh, when they run out, they order more, basically. Um, so that's going, I mean, this is about the revenue, of course, but it's, it's about the, the learning from the, from the beta launch as well. But it's very nice to have all these things being sorted out with, we thought the best way to really learn all these things is to actually have real paying customers. There's dozens of vets who've ordered it. Um, Texas A&M have given us great feedback just on the actual running of the tests themselves. And as I said, the actual test is working absolutely perfectly. This is all the marketing and the packaging and all those kind of things. But yeah, so they ordered 7,000, which is enough for 160 dogs. And they've reordered, uh, it was two times last week and now it's three times. Um, and they just keep reordering a, a batch once they, um, I guess you call it just in time ordering <laughs> as they as they finished the, the previous one, so that's uh, exactly in line with where we thought they'd be. Um, we haven't obviously done a lot of marketing. We're at that, we've done a bits and pieces with the key opinion leaders and uh, throughout Texas, but obviously nothing nationally. Um, so this is the kind of the, the the level we're expecting, and it's been absolutely great from the feedback point of view. And I think it's really helped us sharpen our pencil for the for the international and national launch, and, and also. Uh, again, I think it's really focused the mind on the big companies that, um, you know, the trains, we, with the trains moving, if they want to get aboard, they've got to get aboard. I think uh, if we'd um, not launched, I think there would be a lot, it wasn't the same level of interest before we launched as there is now. Um, because at the moment, we are the monopoly in the space. There is absolutely nothing else out there in the cancer space in the vet market. So I think we're in an excellent position. But if we can work out a deal with one of the, the, the majors, I think that uh, would be very good for us and good for them. But if for any reason we don't, um, then we've shown the ability we can launch ourselves. So I think it's been an absolute win-win all around. Thank you. And then I'd also like to ask about um, netosis, specifically netosis outside of COVID-19, because, I mean, you really need a bit of a crystal ball to determine where the pandemic is going. So, so what's the, the size of the opportunity for other net associated uh, diseases, you know, in terms of something like sepsis or influenza or any of the other ones? Um, I'll let Jake answer that from a more technical point of view, but I think uh, my non-technical word would be absolutely massive, uh, bigger than cancer. Uh, sepsis is the biggest killer in, in hospitals, and it tends to kill you because you don't know it's coming, and also there's very few actual therapies for it. Um, so we're working with a range of groups who've been working on therapies for a while, and the uh, spotlight from the t from COVID from the tosis has certainly allowed them to really progress, like Santosis, their therapies. So I, I think it's potentially um, uh, as big or bigger than the other things we do. Uh, why is that sepsis? As I said, it's it's very hard to actually know you to measure the nets and the advancement as disease progression. It's very hard to know a prognostic, and it's very hard to treat at the moment. Uh, and part of the treatment issue is there's, if there's nothing good as a companion diagnostic, then it's very hard to, to have a treatment because if you can't monitor it, uh, the first thing you've got to know is if you have too many nets because, as Jake points out a lot, the nets are actually very good for you and, until they're not. So you don't want to be removing someone's primary defense mechanism unless it's really in excess. So I, I think for all those reasons, um, our assay has, in, in the evidence we've shown uh, recently in, in a range of different studies, um, ours works extremely well in the, in the diagnostic, disease monitoring, 
and uh, disease progression. And uh, we're hopeful from what we've seen also from prognostic. So, uh, well, I, that's not a, a scientific term, uh, massive, but uh, you know we're working through that now. But it, it could be uh, something which you give a lot to everyone who comes into hospital because if you know sepsis, as you said, creeps up on you and it can kill you very, very quickly, knowing that it's that your net, nets are building up would be incredibly useful. And uh, I think uh, we've certainly got a solution, and it's certainly low cost, easy to use. Um, and so I think we could be a big part of it. Jake, uh, do you want to answer that slightly more scientifically, perhaps? Yeah. Hi, Jason. Um, well, f first of all, nets nets is a huge area. It's not it's not just COVID. So uh, I think if you <clears throat> are talking to people working in intensive care in COVID, they're they're now completely. Um, talking about nets all the time, and nets has sort of exploded as a subject in medicine. And um, talking to people in in intensive care, uh, I, I have uh, literally had conversations that go like, you know, if you talk to people in our hospital a year or two ago, nobody would have heard nets. This is clinicians, and uh, and now everybody's talking about nets. And so COVID has really woken up the world to to nets and their and their role in all sorts of diseases, and COVID has, has sort of cleared the path. But uh, but actually, it's not it's not just COVID. So as Cameron mentioned, net are what drives uh, the pathology in sepsis, and sepsis is the biggest uh, killer in hospitals worldwide. It's also these are just examples. It, it, it's active in all sorts of areas of diseases that have other names, but the underlying driving factor, or one of the main driving factors, is, is nets in every case. So um, a lot of people with cancer actually die of thrombosis, and it's, the thrombosis is, is what actually um, uh, kills you in the end. Uh, nets uh, drives thrombosis and microthrombosis. Um, nets drives a lot of, um, of um, strokes and uh, lung blockages. Nets drives uh, a lot of the amputations that occur in very bad diabetes cases uh, and, and all sorts of varieties of other autoimmune diseases, the, the, um, the actual very bad symptoms when, when these diseases flare are also related to NETS. So whilst COVID has uh, sort of shone a light, if you like, on NETS and, brought, and, and made them everybody aware, uh, actually, they have a they have a much wider role, and 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 COVID has shone a light simply because it's you know such a high mortality rate and so clearly associated with net that it's shone a light on problem which is much wider than that. So I, you know, we've we've opened a net a net division um, within within the company to to take advantage of that situation, and um, and COVID's a, a huge uh, hopefully temporary opportunity, but the, the opportunity is, is much, much bigger than COVID. Thank you, Jake. Right, thank um, you. Yeah, it, it couldn't possibly be bigger. Sorry. Thanks, Chris. I was just going to say, I really appreciate the uh, thorough answers. Uh, one more, you know, quick one, if you don't mind. I want to ask about the proof of concept study in um, DLBCL. How, how does the trial design compare to the um, to the large regulatory study, at least for that you know DLBCL leg? And, and can this be used uh, potentially as a read through for that first data readout and potential filing in blood cancers? Um, yes, actually, that's probably a question for Jason, uh, who's our expert on that. Could I could I have him um, call in on the uh, if we have a call afterwards? He, uh, he he's an expert in all those. I don't want to make any answers, which perhaps could be incorrect. Um, unless you would know that, Jake, or should we leave that to Jason? No, I think it's better if Jason answers that. <laughs> Sorry, Jason uh, has organised all these trials, and he's spent a huge amount of effort uh, studying all the different types of uh, NHL. So. Uh, it's probably better if, if I don't uh, go off piece and try and answer that, if, if that's okay. Ah, no, there's no, there's no problem. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you for taking my questions. Thank you. Next question is coming from the line of Nathan Weinstein with Aegis Capital. Please see if there are questions. Hey, good morning, and thanks so much for taking my questions. Uh, so maybe Thank just you. looping back to uh, the veterinary market, you know, the beta launch going on in New QVet. 
Uh, you've shared some of the feedback and obviously discussed some of the revenue opportunities, but maybe you could just dive in a little more on the color you're hearing uh, from the veterinarians and sort of any uh, anecdotal feedback that you're getting. Yes, I think uh, obviously there's a lot of things we've been learning. Um, some of the feedback on the on the fasting, um, going for a smaller fasting is, is very helpful. Um, the shipping, um, we're looking to perhaps have provide a packaging for them to make it easier for them. Also, uh, while we're also talking to the big partners, if they could just drop it into an envelope with all the other blood tests, that would be easier for them than shipping it to uh, a separate lab. Um, but, uh, you know, I think as we've talked about, there's absolutely nothing else out there. So it's been a lot of education as well. And there's a lot of discussion whether it's a cancer test um, in a sick dog or what I think is more likely, it's, it's actually, uh, and the biggest market of all, is where you're testing parting with, as part of the wellness test. For dogs, I think, you know, a large percentage of dogs in the U.S. Um, get uh, a wellness test every year, and uh, I think that's where we'll end up uh, uh, positioning ourselves, but that's, that's all in the process now. And so uh, there's been a lot of work. Also, there's been a lot of interest in um, uh, treatment monitoring. Um, I think you remember Heather presented a small amount of data showing that it uh, worked very well for that as well, and there are millions of cases of these cancers every year, and the current methods of monitoring treatment are... Uh, very average at best. So there's been a lot of feedback that that would be very, very useful. Um, we've also been working with, uh, we said we've been in discussions with some of the bigger companies. Uh, we're discussing pricing uh, quite uh, quite heavily too. Um, you know, what would, uh, what would the discounting in price mean for extra sales? I mean, our ambition is to have millions of tests sold per year at what kind of price point. Um, obviously, you don't want to sell it cheaper than, than we need to, but also um, we'd like to have it as widely accepted as, as, as possible, so we're just looking through that at the moment um, and trying to work with uh, our own team uh, in Texas and our own feedback, as well as with some other groups, if they were to work with us launching what the, the optimum pricing would be to really... Um, our aim in all this has not to be made, not to have a small number of tests at a high value, but try to make it really, really widely adopted. Um, so, yes, yeah, the, the pricing has been a big discussion and all the logistics and also, uh, there's been a lot of feedback on the monitoring of treatment for these cancers would be very, very useful. So that's uh, probably the next product off the rank, um, which uh, should be in the short to medium term as well. And I think that would also be very, very well accepted. So it's a whole range of things, um, and uh, there's, there's quite a lot of things in the mix there. But I'd like to reiterate, when, when we say beta testing, it's not the actual product itself. That has worked incredibly well. It's doing exactly what it should be doing to vary uh, all the feedback not just in the vet space, but all the human space when we've shipped it to a, a very wide range of groups. They're all incredibly impressed of the analytical validity. It's measuring exactly what it should be doing. It's very, very reproducible and very robust. So the rest is all the, the, the product launch things we're learning. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Cameron, for covering that. And, you know, Volition overall has been a really nice engine of innovation across all the areas in human and vet and the work that Jake and the rest of your team is doing. It was really um, quite exciting to watch. And then I guess just sticking with the theme of that here, um, when we think about, like, all the learning that you're getting from, from this beta, uh, do you think you have uh, – will build out the uh, product portfolio in that and have uh, some more products in adjacent areas within the animal health space? Oh, I, I, absolutely, undoubtedly. Um, so I think uh, the easiest ones to launch next and where the feedback uh, we've been listening is on the monitoring of, of disease or, you know, the treatment uh, monitoring. Uh, and that's something which is quite easy to do with what we have, and we've had some very encouraging data. Uh, not enough to launch a product, um, but that's something Heather is collecting now. So we're hopeful we can really broaden that out in the kind of short, in the next few quarters as well. Uh, obviously, there are other cancers um, and which we're working on. And uh, as we've discussed before, the incredibly exciting thing about what we do is the nucleosomes are not just preserved between human and dogs, but every species. So. Um, the big vet companies are trying to get uh, cats <laughs> notoriously uh, prickly in coming into vet offices, so they're trying to find reasons to get uh, cat owners into, into the vet as well. And uh, so I think there's potentially a, a big market in the cat market for, and it's obviously from all the things we've seen, the, the nucleosomes are not just cancer, there can be a lot of other things as well. So I, I think this is the, uh, the starting gun, not the finishing line, uh, in the range of products we can launch. And I think um, also I mentioned it briefly, but we're also looking to greatly strengthen the team in the vet side too. We've been doing it with the Volition team, but we really want a commercial focus from the vet space. So expect to see in the short term um, some key hires to really drive uh, the vet as a separate 
uh, entity within Volition, but as a separate entity. Um, and that would help us to really expand, not only internationally, I think the Asian and the European launches are something we'll be doing medium term as well. And I think we'll not just go to dogs, but a range of other species, not, not this year, but in the coming years, um, because it is exactly the same platform. It just comes down to uh, some slight ad adaptations, certainly between humans and dogs, and we'd expect the same for cats. And then you can go into veterinary animals and the, the larger animals. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a, a, a very big story. Thanks, Cameron. As a dog owner, I, I'm glad you started with dogs and not with cats. And uh, I appreciate the color <laughs> there as well. <laughs> thank, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, our, our final question is coming from Bruce Jackson, Benchmark Company. Please proceed with your questions. Thank you. Hey, Cameron. Um, you touched on the uh, new Q capture. You touched on the uh, new Q capture program, and um, I just wondered if you could maybe give us some of the highlights and um, if the uh, next data reads can be on the circulating tumor cell program. Uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> thank you. That was, we didn't put it in this uh, call because obviously it's uh, a lot happening. So again, we were focusing on the, the product launches and, and, and uh, everything else we're doing. So we've taken on a, a small team in the US. Uh, why in California, that's where the hub of a lot of epigenetics is. So to get the best people, um, we thought a small team there doing a lot of this would be very helpful. So just a quick uh, re uh, recap of where we are. Um, this is something also, it's, we have the four pillars we always talk about. Uh, the vet is pillar one and pillar, well, one of the pillars. The human cancers and mitosis are the three pillars apart from capture. So we showed uh, last year that we could separate uh, long from short nucleosomes. And what it is from just for everyone else's benefit is now that the antibodies are on a, a magnetic bead, you can pull out the nucleosomes to be analyzed. So uh, once you have the nucleosome, you also have the DNA, and we showed we could separate the long from the short DNA. Who cares? Why is that interesting? The short DNA has been shown to uh, be where the cancer uh, DNA nucleosomes are, so potentially a fantastic enabling technology for everything in liquid biopsy space. Once you also have the nucleosome, you also can do mass spectrometry, um, and actually uh, that's gone very, very well, and we've uh, been working with our collaborators and there's a, a paper in, in, in the offering on, on showing how well that works as well. And that's also potentially a service um, where we're the only group that can actually do all this and do the mass spectrometry. So again, part of the revenue we're looking to do is things through servicing uh, from Silver One. This is another source of it. So from the actual uh, concentration of the nucleosome site, uh, uh, we did it, but like anything we've done before, um, it sometimes it works better than others, so we realized we kind of pressed pause on driving forward and we went through a re-optimization process like we've done for the assays, like we've done in everything we've done. So we, we went back and, and just pulled it apart to make sure everything was fully optimized from the coding of the beads to uh, 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 actually using the antibodies which can actually be mass produced, all the things that uh, would, would need to be a product and a service. So that's gone very, very well. Um, we'll have a lot more data on that. Uh, they're coming to the the final stages of the process of that from the sequencing side, the mass spec is actually looking very good and that's already in, in publication ready. So I, I think that's something we'll have um, news on certainly this year and hopefully sooner rather than later this year um, on the key aspects of it, which is, and there's three key aspects. There's the sequencing side, there's the mass spectrometry side, and then there's the, um, the transcription, transcription factors. And uh, I think uh, the team has done an excellent job at optimizing all those it's one thing to have showing something works. It's quite another to have it ready for a product. So that's what they've been doing, and um, I think they've done a, a, an excellent job. J Jake, is that um, how you said? Yeah, I think all of that's all of that spot on. And and uh, uh, the guys in California have made great strides towards uh, changing it from being something that that clearly can work to something that does work every time. Does that answer your question, Bruce? It does. Um, congratulations on all the progress, and thanks for taking my question. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. And, uh, gentlemen, I'm going to turn it briefly over to Scott. He has um, he has heard uh, uh, from uh, an answer. He has an answer for you. Go ahead, Scott. Oh, hi, guys. Um, just regarding Michael's question earlier, I just heard back from Jason Terrell um, about the blood cancer study. Uh, so, Michael, oh, to answer, <laughs> Michael, to answer your question from earlier, I'm going to quote uh, from Jason. The 
DCBCL POC study is a treatment response monitoring test, whereas the larger 1,500 study is an aid to diagnosis of the disease, so the readouts are not related. We also hope to have the treatment response data in the coming months as the study has almost been completed. Hopefully that answers your question, Michael. Thank you. I'll turn the call back to Cameron for closing remarks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, obviously, a lot going on. It's been a very interesting year for everyone. I'm sure uh, we're all adapting to working from home. But I think from everything we've done and everything we have been, uh, we've had a fantastic year, uh, not only in the capital raising side, but also the product side, development side, the team. Um, it's all worked out uh, incredibly well. And I think this is just going to be an absolutely fabulous year. I mean, it's been a real pleasure working with the team um, that we, we've uh, managed to get all this done with. And uh, the next few quarters, I think we're just going to be picking up speed. And uh, we're going to be focused as much as we can on making sure uh, all the green shoots of revenue in all the different areas, we, we continue to grow. And uh, we make the company have, have a lot of varied revenue streams and, uh, and also all the very exciting research and development at the heart of epigenetics. So thank you for your time. Thank you. This will conclude today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time, and we thank you for your participation.